die suffering at the hands of Rome because they believed in Christ alone they died through Europe especially Spain for they saw all but Christ is vain he suffered by his death for men to save them from their awful sin 600 years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Okay, we're reading from Romanism and the Reformation by Henry Grattan Guinness. We're on the middle of the page 363, if you're following along on the online copy of the book. Henry Grattan Guinness says, All sorts of methods were used for the detection of heretics. Bishops, that is, Roman Catholic bishops, were to gird themselves for the work of ferreting out and exterminating them. That is the heretics. Now, who are the heretics? Bible-believing Protestants, those who believe that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. These are the ones most hated by the Roman Catholic Church. All right, the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church were to gird themselves for the work of ferreting out and exterminating Bible-believing Protestants. And all the Franciscans and the Dominican monks were to supply instruments for carrying out this process of inquisition and blood. The Waldenses and the Albigenses were, of course, especially singled out for extermination. Why? Because the Waldenses and the Albigensians were French and Italian Protestants. They believed, as do I, as, as do did all Bible-believing Protestants before the Protestant Reformation even got started. They believed that the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, was the papacy. Okay? That's why the Waldenses and the Albigensians were sought out first and foremost to be exterminated. They were called the heretics, and under the Third and Fourth Vatican Council, of the Roman Catholic Church, it was determined that Protestants were heretics and it was no crime. More than that, it was a meritorious work to kill a heretic. And so the war was waged against the Waldenses and the Albigensians until they were nearly completely exterminated off the face of the earth. You had carte blanche forgiveness of all your sins and you were guaranteed, according to the papacy, in, 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 in calling this crusade, you were ipso facto absolved of any sin that you might commit during the prosecution of this crusade, and you were guaranteed a home in heaven. That's what plenary absolution means. The papacy in calling this crusade, this holy war against the Waldenses and the Albigensians, was punctuated with the guarantee that there was absolutely no sin that you could commit during the prosecution of that war that would not be forgiven. Okay, A crusade was proclaimed against the Waldenses and the Albigensians 
and plenary absolution was promised to all who should perish in the holy war. Never was a more merciless spirit of murder exhibited than by these terrible crusaders against the meek and the lowly and Christian-spirited Vaudois. Okay, and that's another French term for the word Waldensians and Albigensians. Okay, Vaudois is a reference to the valley people. The valley people were the Waldenses and the Albigensians. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the Inquisition, that invention of the Dominicans, or rather, more perfectly, Gregory the Fourth established its horrid tribunal for making inquest after unseen secret heresy. And wherever any rival of true religion, now, of course, true religion means Roman Catholicism, wherever revival of true, oh, no, excuse me, I pardon me, he says that any, any instance of a revival of true religion took place or any confessors of Christ could be found, they were hunted if possible, to death, okay? Anywhere true Bible-believing Christians were found, anywhere true religion was taking place, they were hunted down and killed. That's a crusade against God's people. The Bible plainly tells us that he wore out the saints of the Most High, that they were given into his hand for a time, times, and the dividing of time. He's a bloody persecutor of the saints, that's the papacy, the Antichrist. That's why they called him the Antichrist. He was, and he was the Antichrist, and he proved it in history because he killed God's people. And he said, genuine disciples of Christ, under whatever name they might pass, whether called Pretrobrutians, Catharists, Waldenses, Albigenses, Wycliffeites, Lollards, Hussites, Bohemians, or by any other name, it mattered not to the torture and to the stake with them if they held fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So who were those that held fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It was the Petrobrusians, the Catharists, the Waldenses, the Albigensians, the Wycliffeites, the Lollards, the Hussites, and the Bohemians. We've mentioned them over and over and over throughout the years of, of Inquisition Update. Now, he says Savonarola, one of the wisest and worthiest of his age, was burnt at the stake in 1498. So Savonarola was a Bible-believing Protestant. He believed that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And it says seven years of cruel war waged against the Hussites and a civil persecution more bitter still. 18,000 soldiers were sent into the valleys of Piedmont. That's the Vaudois, the valley people, the valleys of Piedmont. And it says towards the end of the 14th century to exterminate the Waldenses of Piedmont and to appropriate to themselves all their property. Okay? Roman Catholic canon law states specifically under the Third and Fourth Vatican Council that once the heretics are destroyed, their properties are distributed to the church and those who belong to it. That's what these crusaders could look forward to. Not only plenary indulgence for all their sins, but they, they, they want a stake in divvying up all the property of the heretics. And I don't need to tell you, the Valley of the Alps is the most fertile ground in the area. So there was every incentive in the world to go on this crusade for the Pope against these Bible-believing Christians. And it says the Christians of Valois, uh, Valois that is uh, the, the, the valley called Louise in Dauphiny, were actually exterminated, burned alive, and suffocated in the caves in which they had sought refuge. They were literally pushed into caves in the mountains Firewood was stacked up over the, the entrances to the cave, and they were burned. That's how Rome dealt with the God-fearing, Bible-believing Protestants of the valleys of the Alps. And it says 400 infants were found dead in their mother's arms, and 3,000 perished in the struggle. Lorente calculates from official records that in the 40 years prior to the Reformation, 
The Inquisition alone burned 13,000 persons and condemned 169,000. The latter half of the 15th century was a time of Satan's raging against the saints. But in spite of the racks and the prisons and the sword and the flame, the voices of the witnesses of Jesus Christ were still raised in behalf of the truth and against the power and pretensions of Antichrist, the papacy. At last, however, as the 15th century drew to a close, the furious crusade seemed about to accomplish its object. The beast had all but conquered and killed the witnesses, according to the prediction. The strong figure employed of the witnesses lie, lying dead for three and a half days means, of course, that their testimony was silenced. They no longer prophesied. They were silent, helpless, extinct for a brief period. They were worn out. The wild beast from the abyss had prevailed against them. For the moment, the struggle was over. To bring home to you some scripture, that he wears out the saints of the Most High, that he's guilty of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, it's speaking of the papacy. Make no mistake. The fulfillment of this part of the vision was at the opening of the 16th century, just before the Reformation movement commenced. Here, Mosheim's description of the crisis, quote, as the 16th century opened, no danger seemed to threaten the Roman pontiffs. The agitations excited in former centuries by the Waldenses and the Albigensians and the Burgards and others, and afterwards by the Bohemians, had been suppressed and extinguished by counsel and by sword. The surviving remnant of the surviving, the, excuse me, the surviving remnant of the Waldenses hardly lived. Pent up in the narrow limits of the Piedmontese valleys and those of the Bohemians through their weakness and ignorance could attempt nothing and thus were an object of contempt rather than fear, unquote. Milner, the church historian, says that at this date, though the name of Christ was professed everywhere in Europe, nothing existed that could properly be called evangelical. In other words, nothing existed that could properly be called Protestant. Okay, Protestantism was nearly wiped out. All the confessors of Christ, quote, worn out by a long series of contentions, were reduced to silence, unquote. Quoting further, he says, everything was quiet, says another writer, every heretic exterminated, unquote. This was not, of course, literally true. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and had even that in that darkest hour of the, of the night that preceded the dawn, his own were served his own who served him secretly. Okay? God knows his own, even those who serve him secretly. But so far as collective testimony before Europe was concerned, the witnesses were dead. Their enemies gloried in the fact. The Lateran Council congratulated itself that Christendom was no longer afflicted by heresies. And, as one of its orators said, addressing Pope Leo X, and I'm not good at Latin, but here's the English translation of what he said, quote, there is an end of resistance to the papal rule, and religious oppressors exist no more, unquote. And again, quoting, he says, the whole body of Christendom is now seen to be subject to its head, i.e., to thee, unquote. Okay, the whole body of Christendom is now seen to be subjected to its head, the Pope. Now, Leo commanded a great jubilation. Pope Leo X commanded a great jubilation, a jubilee, okay, and granted a plenary indulgence in honor of the event. 
Okay, if you participated in this jubilee, then you were given a plenary indulgence, forgiven for all your sins and guaranteed a place in heaven. That's how the popes man manipulate the whole world. And it says, Dean Waddington, <clears throat> describing the close of this council, says, quote, the pillars of Rome's strength were visible and palpable, and she surveyed them with exal exaltation from her golden palaces, unquote. Further quoting, it says, the assembled prelates separated with complacency and confidence and with mutual congratulations on the peace, unity, and purity of the apostolic church. Okay? They dare call the Roman Catholic Church the apostolic church, but that's what they call it nonetheless. And it says, quoting, quoting further, it says, the power of Rome was de facto paramount in the church. Unquote. No contenders. Rome had won the war against the heretics. There was nobody left in Christendom that said that the papacy was the Antichrist. They celebrated the death of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. So Neander says, quote, the edifice of an unlimited papal monarchy had at that time come victoriously out of all the preceding fights and established itself on a firm basis. In the last Lateran Council at Rome, the principle of the unlimited power of the Pope was established in opposition to the principle of general councils, and the Waldensians and the Hussites had no more any importance to the fight against the papacy, unquote. So another writer says, quote, at the commencement of the 16th century, Europe reposed in the deep sleep of spiritual death. There was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped, unquote. So Europe was completely conquered for the papacy. It had no more opposition, at least according to Rome's estimation. The papacy had been victorious over the saints of Almighty God. It says the witnesses were dead. Never before and certainly never since was Rome able to congratulate herself that heresy was extinguished and heretics exterminated from the face of Christendom. In its fine, striking hieroglyph of the crisis that prophecy presents, there stands the fierce wild beast monster of the abyss. He has prevailed against his defenseless human victims. The struggle has been long and hard. It has made him all the more savage and impatient. But it is over at last. His jowls still drop with gore. His claws are red with the blood. And he stands glaring with his fierce eyes on the pale, cold, silent corpses of Christ's two witnesses, so long empowered from above to resist and defy all his might. As John watched the sad scene, did there not recur to his mind scenes in the amphitheaters of pagan Rome, scenes in which the Doré was examined and painted for us, scenes with which the exile of Patmos was all too familiar? The arena strewn in the pale moonlight with the cold, stiff corpses of faithful witnesses for Christ, the victorious wild beast glutted and sufficed with their flesh and blood standing guard over the remains. That was the symbol. The reality was witnessing churches silenced by long and bloody persecution. The time, A.D. 1514, the close of that last Lateran Council, which proclaimed to the world in a, in a formal official manner the fact that all opposition to Rome had ceased. <clears throat> now note the sequel in 1517. The Protestant Reformation began. The movement which, like a snowball growing ever greater as it rolls along, has in the year 1887 150 million of adherents, all professing the faith of Jesus Christ in opposition to the apostasy of Rome. Okay? Witnessing churches... Protestant churches, <clears throat> Protestant churches sprang up everywhere, 
and have been multiplying ever since. What shall we say? Is not this a resurrection of the witnesses? The two witnesses? Rome had crushed them, had she? So she thought, but she knew better before 50 years had rolled by. She knew better when Germany threw off her yoke and England withdrew from her communion and Holland resisted her, region, her legions and the trumpet of Protestant defiance deafened her ears and the earthquake of Refor Reformation revolution shook her throne. And when the outburst of heavenly light so illumined the minds of men that they laughed at her once dreaded excommunications, sat unmoved under the thunders of her interdicts and boldly tearing the mask of Mother Church from her face, exposed her as the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. What more eloquent words could describe the Protestant Reformation? At the very time Rome thought she had defeated all of her Protestant enemies, all the enemies of Antichrist, then up sprang the Protestant Reformation. And over half of Europe was liberated from papal tyranny. He says they were dead, were they? The witnesses of Christ? They had no longer any voice to testify, any courage to struggle, any fortitude to resist? So Rome fancied till the spirit of life from God entered into them and they rose up a mighty host to proclaim the glad tidings throughout Europe to do and dare to die in their myriads, denouncing Rome's doctrines of devils with such boldness and power as to arrest the attention of the world and to produce a revolution of unexampled greatness in Christendom. Rome reeled on its seven hills as if shaken by an earthquake, and a tenth part of the Babylonian city fell. England, one of the ten kingdoms into which the Western Roman Empire had been divided, fell away, separated from Latin Christendom. Thousands perished in a terrible struggle which ensued in many lands, and Rome was worsted in her warfare. The rise of Protestantism was, as the very name attests, the resurrection of the witnesses. The reformers themselves recognized it as such, and their enemies also. Antichrist Pope Adrian, Pope Leo X's successor, wrote in a brief to the Diet of Nuremberg, quote, The heretics Huss and Jerome seem now to be alive again in the person of Martin Luther, unquote. The Reformation of the 16th century commenced in the year 1517. The translation and publication of the Word of God, the definition of Protestant doctrine, and the founding of Protestant churches occupied the next half century, while the liberation of the Protestant states from papal dominion was not completed until the century which followed. During much of this period, the war of the wild beast against the witnesses continued, and with its sufferings, sackcloth, testimony, and slaughter of the latter. The birth of Protestant churches and nations in the first half of the 16th century did not, however, as we know, mark the close of Rome's bitter and bloodthirsty opposition to the truth. The papal war against the witnesses continued to rage all through that century and all through the next with undiminished hatred and cruelty. But there was one great difference. In pre-Reformation times, the beast had the best of it. He prevailed against the saints. He wore them out and was at last so far victorious that for a few brief years, he completely silenced all corporate testimony to the truth. But after the marvelous resurrection of the witnesses, after the uprising of powerful Protestant communities, duly organized on a permanent basis and backed up by civil power, the papacy was never again able to silence the witnessing churches as a whole, never again able to prevail against them simultaneously in all quarters. Her victims had been transformed into her powerful enemies, 
And while Rome prevailed against the reformers in some lands, they, pre they prevailed against her in others. Henceforth, Roman Catholicism, Roman Christendom as it is called, was divided into two camps. And as of old, the house of Saul gave weaker, uh, grew weaker and weaker, and the house of David stronger and stronger. So there was a gradual loss of power on the part of the papacy and the papal nations. And as time passed on, a gradual growth in political influence, material prosperity, intellectual enlightenment, and social condition on the part of the Protestant nations. But at first, the struggle was a sore one. Just as Pharaoh pursued the people after he had been expelled, after he had been expelled reluctantly to let them go. Rather, just as Pharaoh pursued the people after he had been compelled reluctantly to let them go and pursued them to the annihilation of his own power, so Rome pursued the young Protestant churches of Europe to her own undoing in the end. She stirred up opposition and international conflicts instigated bloody massacres and cruel exiles and banishments and plunged the reformed communities into a sea of sorrow and trouble. Witness the terrible massacre of St. Bartholomew with its 60,000 victims in France, the Marian persecutions in England, the cruel slaughter in six brief years of 18,000 Protestants in the Netherlands, the 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 res the de excuse me, the desolating 30 years war in Central Europe and the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which in 1685 exiled 400,000 Huguenots from France and caused the death of nearly, uh, of nearly as many more. This may be regarded as the last great act of the papal war against the witnesses of God. Protestantism had to pass through a long, drawn-out agony before Rome recognized not its right to exist, but she still denies that, denies that, but its existence and growth as a fact against which was useless to fight. It was not till the close of the 17th century, not until the glorious revolution which placed William of Orange on the throne of England in, eight, in 1689, that Protestantism was firmly established in England. This event took place about three and a half years after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Papal supremacy had been abrogated. Many listeners don't know what the revocation of the Edict of Nantes means. Let me explain. The Edict of Nantes was, was a result of religious persecution in France. And that being tired of Jesuit influence, being tired of religious wars, the government of France issued an edict making religious liberty the law of the land. They were going to finally put aside all this religious fighting in, 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 in France that kept the people all torn up and kept the, pay, the throne of, of uh, the king of France in jeopardy. So they issued the Edict of Nantes demanding religious liberty for everybody. But when Rome got under, got, and the Jesuits got control of the government of France again, the first thing to go out the window was the Edict of Nantes. Religious warfare was to resume, and it was Rome to conquer the Protestants. Okay, so the revocation of the Edict of Nantes means religious persecution by Roman Catholics against Protestants. The war, the Counter-Reformation War, resumed against God's people. And it says papal supremacy had been abrogated in England in 1534, but in the reign of Mary, and again under the Popish Stuart family, it, its very existence was imperiled afresh. <coughs> the Peace of Ryswick, uh, Ryswick at the close of 1697, first completely established the civil and religious liberty of Protestantism. All this proves that while the first stage of the resurrection of the witnesses took place at the commencement of the Reformation movement of, six, of the 16th century, their exaltation to political power and supremacy, the establishment of Protestantism, occupied a much longer interval. 
like all other similar great movements, the Protestant Reformation started from an epoch, ended over an era. <coughs> Extended over an era, correction. So the author is equating the two witnesses as the Protestant Reformation. When the Bible finally opened the hearts and minds of, of Europe against the papacy. It's what we call today the Old and the New Testament. Those are the two witnesses. They were personified by the Protestant reformers. The two witnesses of God in the Bible are the Old Testament, which I call the Law and the Prophets, and the New Testament, which I call the Fulfillment. These, the Protestant reformers completely comprehended. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Law and the Prophets and the Fulfillment. And they put it into practice. And what did they do? They named the papacy as the biblical, historical, and prophetic Antichrist of Scripture. And they led a war, a spiritual war, against the papists. Okay? They led a spiritual war. And what was their weapon? The two witnesses. The Old and the New Testament. God's holy word in, in its entirety. And that's how they were ultimately victorious over the Antichrist papacy. And if there's any victory to be had for Bible-believing Protestants today, it is to carry that two-edged sword, the two witnesses, and do today what they did during the time of the Protestant Reformation. All right? All this proves that while... The first stage of the resurrection of the witnesses took place at the commencement of the Reformation movement of the 16th century. Their exaltation to political power and supremacy, the establishment of Protestantism, occupied a much longer interval. Like all other similar great movements, the Reformation started from an epoch, ended uh, extended over an era. Space prohibits the exhibition and the chronology of this most remarkable period, including its relation to the 1260 years prophecy. Suffice it to say that the interval from 1534, the date of the abrogation of papal supremacy in England, and the publication of Martin Luther's Bible in Germany to A.D. 1697 and 8, the date of the complete establishment of Protestantism at the Peace of Weisrick is separated by exactly 1,260 lunar years from A.D. 312 to 476, or the period which extended from the fall of paganism at the conversion of Constantine to the fall of the Western Roman Empire. He says, I've not attempted, nor could I, in the comp in the compass of this lecture attempt to expound fully the wonderful reformation vision <laughs> excuse me the wonderful reformation vision of the book of revelation i've only glanced at its leading features there is in it very much more of the deepest interest which i dare not touch on at this time because it would take me too long but have I not said enough to convince you that the great and blessed revival of true doctrine and of spiritual life which took place between three and four centuries ago and which we call the Protestant Reformation was both foreshadowed in Jewish history and foretold in Christian prophecy and that in connection with each of the wonderful predictions, the seal of God's approval is conspicuously set on the movement what is the vision of Revelation 10? One of a divine interference given back to the church, the Bible, and the preaching of the gospel, and formally separating between apostate Christendom and the true church of Jesus Christ. 
what is the retrospective narrative told by the angel? It is the story of witnessing churches sustained for long centuries amid sorrow and poverty and shame, destroyed at last as, cor uh, as corporate bodies by the ferocious attacks of the Roman beast, resuscitated, however, after a long brief interval and exalted to political power in spite of all enemies. Such is the prediction, such have been the facts. How came the strange prediction to be incorporated 1,800 years ago with these sacred writings? Realize, if you can, the stupendous marvel of the fact that it is here in this book and that myriads of men of all nations were for ages engaged, all unconsciously to themselves, in fulfilling it. Realize, if you can, the sublime tenderness and sacred sympathetic approval with which the Savior uttered those simple words, my two witnesses. Yes, Lord, they were thy witnesses, those poor persecuted, persecuted Lollards and Huguenots, those martyred Waldenses and Paulicians, thy witnesses, thou blessed sufferer, who didst thyself resist unto blood, striving against sin. They were witnesses to thy grace, to thy glory, and to thine all-sufficient atonement, to thine only high priesthood and soul mediatorship. And for this they suffered, for this they died. They suffered with thee, they shall reign with thee, According to thine own words, quote, where I am, there shall also my servant be, my two witnesses. Ah, Lord, how thou didst love thy faithful martyrs, how thou dost hate the cruel and evil system which for ages made bitter war upon them and would fain do so still. In persecuting them, did it not persecute thee? Oh, how often didst thou ask of Pope and Prelate, as of Saul of Tarsus in earlier days, why persecutest thou me? As we think of these things, must we not share the feelings of the psalmist who said, quote, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? Am I, am I not grieved with them that rise up against thee? Unquote. Far, far be it from us to sympathize with the persecutors and lightly esteem the true witnesses, as is the fashion with too many in our days. Let us rather maintain against the great enemy of the gospel and the same testimony they held fast amid their fierce on, on, his fierce onslaughts and thus share with them the honor of being numbered by Christ among his faithful witnesses. We must bear up the sword again against the Antichrist of Rome. No more ecumenical movement. No more peace and unity without truth. No more making mockery of the blessed saints of Almighty God, those who've died over the centuries by the hundreds of millions who have died at the hands of the papacy. No more shall we mock and disgrace their names by seeking ecumenical unity with the Church of Rome, the horror of Revelation chapter 17. Let us repent of the ecumenical movement. There was no ecumenical movement during the time of the Protestant Reformation, and there should be no ecumenical movement today. For to ecumenically reunite with the Roman Catholic Church is to ecumenically reunite, spiritually reunite with those who have killed the saints of God for nearly two millennia. It's the greatest sin against Christ <clears throat> since the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> now, Henry Grattan Guinness gives us some closing remarks. He says, on the practical bearing of the subject, he said, we must, tr he says, we trust that the lectures to which you have listened have produced in your mind the profound conviction 
that the existence and character of Romanism, the entire history of the papacy, was foretold in the Bible long ages before that evil arose in the earth. If so, the conviction will bear fruit, for knowledge influences conduct. Several practical results of an important nature should follow. Otherwise, we should not have cared to, exp to expound to you this great subject. And first, let your knowledge of this truth confirm and deepen your confidence in the divine inspiration of Scripture. None but God can thus foresee and foretell the events of a long series of unborn ages. In these symbolic prophecies, the history of 12 or 13 centuries is written in advance. Compare them with anything else in the entire circle of literature, and you will realize that they stand apart as a thing unique, like a living man in a gallery of statues. The miracle of the existence of these prophecies in the book and their fulfillment in the facts of history is so great that few minds can grasp it, that not only 12 or 13, but 25 centuries of history should have fallen out exactly as it was foretold in the days of Daniel, they would, is a marvel that nothing but the, incarnate, the incarnation itself can exceed. It is a stupendous miracle in the world of mind, that world which rises high above the world of matter. It, it evinces more markedly the finger of God than any mere physical sign, however great, could do. It appeals to the intel intelligence of the human mind. It challenges the recognition not of the senses, but of the conscience. It sets a seal of supernatural wisdom on the entire Bible. None but God could have delineated beforehand the papal power. Its very unnaturalness forbids the possibility of it being the fruit of human imagination. That a power claiming to act for God, to be as God on the earth and enthroned in the temple of God or the Christian church should yet be his most determined enemy, the opposer of his truth, the destroyer of his saints, the great agent of Satan in the earth, that it should by fraud and corruption and false pretenses rule the world for ages from the very same seven-hilled city of Rome whence it had already been ruled for ages by military force, and that Roman rule should in its Christian stage shed more saintly blood than in its pagan stage. All this could never have been anticipated by man, but only foretold by God himself. It is a demonstration which candor cannot resist of the divine inspiration of this holy book. It is, is not this a practical result? Let criticism carp as it may, it cannot blind our eyes to this gigantic fact that 25 centuries of history have in their leading outline exactly corresponded with Bible predictions. We are bound to conclude that the page that bears the prophecy was written by a divinely guided pen. The tremendous importance of this conclusion is not indicate, uh, uh, need I not indicate I solemnly charge you to reverence this book. It will judge you in the last day. Heaven and earth may pass away, but not a jot or tittle of that word of God shall ever fail. Trust its promises. They are as true as its predictions. Tremble before its warnings and its threats. They will as assuredly be fulfilled in its prophecies as its prophecies have ever been. Study its sacred pages. Never think you know it all. It is as fathomless in its wisdom as is the mind from which it emanates. I have been studying it for more than 30 years, and I'm convinced that it has oceans of truth 
which I have not yet explored. How few really study it, and yet it has riches of wisdom which exceed those of all the libraries on earth. And remember that as certainly as it was uh, as, as it unveiled beforehand the past history of the church and the world, so surely does it unveil and illuminate her critical present and her glorious future. The guidebook that has proved true thus far may be trusted till we reach the goal. Secondly, there are personal, social, and civil duties as regards Romanism and the Reformation arising from the truth we have learned, which are of primary importance and which I must indicate and urge on to urge on you before I close. What is the present position of Romanism in the world? And what the condition of the re Reformed churches? You must be able to answer these questions before you can clearly see your own practical duties in relation to this subject. As to Romanism, I have shown you that its present stage is that of decay and swiftly approaching destruction. Its rise took place 1,300 years ago. It reached the height of its dominion 500 years ago. It received its first fatal blow at the Reformation over 300 years ago, its second in the French Revolution and the end of this century, and the third in the unification of Italy and the liberation of Rome itself from papal rule in 1870. The final blow is yet to fall at the fast approaching advent of Jesus Christ, as described in the end of the 13th chapter of Revelation. To enable you to realize the extent and steady increase of this consumption of decay of Romanism, I will mention a few facts and give you a few figures. Number one, just before the Reformation, Rome boasted that heresy was extinct in Christendom. Not a Protestant existed. She had slain the witnesses of Jesus. Now the number of Protestants is vicariously estimated at from 136 to 150 millions of mankind. In the National Convention of Protestants held last year in Glasgow, the last figure was given as the correct one. Including the Greek, Coptic, and Armenian churches, there are 250 million of professing Christians opposed to Rome and only 180 million subject to her. She has therefore no claim whatsoever to supremacy or universality, but is in a minority as compared to other Christians. Number two, Romanists have during the past century increased 60 million owing to the natural growth of population. At the end of the last century, they numbered 120 million. Now they are 180 million. But Protestants in, in the same period have grown from 40 million 100 to 150 million. In other words, Romanists have increased 50% and Protestants 275%. Going on that same ratio, Protestants will, by the end of this century, equal or exceed Romanists in the world. Had they increased at the same rate, the papacy would now have had 450 millions of adherents instead of only 180 million. It is a, de it is a decadent cause throughout the world. <clears throat> Among the English-speaking populations, the proportions are still more remarkable. And when it is, it is remembered that this section of mankind includes the most enterprising, prosperous, and powerful nations on the earth, the facts are most suggestive. Out of the hundred millions who speak English, only one-seventh are Romanists, including all the Catholics in Ireland and America and in Africa and, their, and our colonies. Everywhere the intelligent, educated English-speaking races, Romanism is an, effet, is an effet religion, and its votaries are being absorbed by the purer and more vigorous faith. In America, it declined 20% in the 10 years between 1863 and 1873. 
in Montreal alone, there are five congregations of ex-Romanists. Even in Ireland, Romanism is decreasing and Protestantism, uh, Protestants are increasing. That is, the disproportionate the disproportion between the two grows less each decade. As regards the United Kingdom, the facts are most remarkable and cheering. At the beginning of the century, the Romanists numbered one-third of the population. Now they are only one-seventh. The proportion of Romanists has decreased from one-third to one-seventh, and that of Protestants has increased from two-thirds to six-sevenths. In other words, whereas in 1801 every third man was a papist, now only every seventh man is a papist. The population has in this interval increased from 16 to 35 million. Protestantism has trembled, excuse me, Protestantism has trebled its numbers and now reaches over 30 million, while Romanism remains stationary at about 5 million. Had it thriven, had it thrived like Protestantism, it would have had 15 million. Now, these statistics tell their own tale. As surely as Romanism rose in the 6th century and culminated in the 13th, so surely is it decaying and falling in the 19th. Not only has it lost all temporal sovereignty and all direct political power, but it has ceased to hold its own in the world, and especially in the foremost nations of it, even as regards its, its adherence. It is consuming and wasting, diminishing while others are increasing and losing even the semblance of a right to the proudly arrogated title of Catholic. But this is only one aspect of the subject. There's another, and a very important one. Romanism is and has been all through, its all through this century, and especially during the last 50 years, making a desperate effort to secure a renewed ascendancy in our empire, and especially in England. It has enormously increased its working staff and its working centers. During the last quarter of the century, that is from 1850 to 1885, its priests in Great Britain have increased by 1,641, its churches, chapels, and stations by 866, its monasteries and convents by 558, and its colleges by 20. This immense and rapid growth is not owing to any proportionate increase of adherence, though it is, of course, designed to secure such an increase, but it indicates the, quote, determination of the papacy to try issues on the grandest scale with Protestantism in its stronghold, unquote. We have to face a deliberate and desperate effort on the part of this wealthy, highly organized and centralized system to weaken and, if possible, subjugate the champion of Protestantism in the earth. The present perplexities of England are the result. Quote, whether we believe it or not, we are again in the old battle, which we thought we had won at the Reformation and at our revolution. It is the struggle for power between the priests of Rome and the people of England. The one, a party small in number, but organized, united, and unwearied. The people, the majority, but divided, distracted, and deceived. The Church of Rome has never concealed her claim. Her chief, Dr. Manning, has repeatedly asserted it. She is to lay down the laws which we are to obey. Our government is to receive and enforce those laws, her success now in Ireland is only a step in her imperial progress. She will never rest till she has gained her ends, till our throne has ceased to be Protestant and our parliament is subservient to her will. Nor is her scheme unreasonable, though as yet incomplete. She has gained a section of the Anglican clergy 
to adopt her principles, use her worship, and teach her dogmas. She returns a considerable section of the members of the House of Commons who think, speak, and vote as she desires. She uses this section to bring pressure to bear on government and parties. To the liberals, she speaks the language of liberalism. To the vo uh, voluntary, she speaks as a voluntary. A large body of the English dissenters and two-thirds of the Free Church of Scotland have fallen into her trap and are now her tools. In Parliament, she is strong. She moves members through her constituencies. She fills some of the public offices with her creatures. She assails all by importunity, flattery, and threats. She has gained a premier who is possibly her disciple, certainly her accomplice. Through him, she commands a cabinet. She works incessantly through the press. No publication too small for her hand, none too strong for her agency. She is served by a host of devoted troops who work with her all their, uh, work all their souls for her under all sorts of names, in all places and disguises. Reporters, writers for the press, literary and scientific men, ministers of state, preachers in the pulpits of the church and of, dis uh, 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 and of dissent, masters of the schools, inspectors, and examiners. She enters families by governesses, tutors, nurses, and domestics. She has secured a large section of our upper classes, and every day she gains more. She draws them by shows, by music, by taste, by frivolity and reflection, by dissipation and remorse. She works on the hearts of women by their fancies, their love of pleasure, and their fear of pain. She makes the wealth of men her exchequer, and the influence of the rich become hers. From the marquee down to the carpenter, she considers none below her notice or too strong for her power. Quote, against this disciplined and able confederacy, you, the English people, have to stand. And for such a fight, you are ill-prepared. Your impulse is right, your disposition is good, but impulse and feeling are insufficient against unscrupulous and unwearied conspirators. You are divided by parties, distracted by business, weakened by indifference. Yet this issue is great. It is whether we are to keep the rights and the liberties which our Protestant forefathers gained. Your freedom stands on your faith. If your faith fails, your freedom will fail. That is the lesson of our own history. For all that we have ever won liberty was had through the strength of Protestant convictions. I ask you to weigh the issue. It is no light matter. It is your life. Don't despise or underrate your adversary, but don't flinch or quail before him either. Rome has in her service the highest intellect and the most untiring zeal. She is served with the talents of the ablest and the passions of the keenest. She uses the vices of men as well as their virtues, and she has no restraints. She adopts herself in all forms of government and all states of society. She plies every class with arguments suited to be uh, uh, with arguments suited to its habits, and she can prevail as well with the accomplished and jaded men of fashion as with the illiterate peasant. Quote, the history which I now put before you tells you what strides she has made in England in the last 40 years. It is for you to decide whether she will go on till she has mastered you or whether you will reassert your power and compel her to obey your laws? That's the real question. I've given you the facts. Draw your own conclusions and act like thoughtful men. Unquote. We urge you carefully to study the pamphlet 
to which these words form the preface. It is a catalog of facts, and they prove that all of our Protestant privileges are in peril, and that it behooves us to be on our guard. Rome makes no secret of her object. It is to reunite England to Latin Christendom by reestablishing papal supremacy here. Quote, if England is ever to be reunited to Christendom, says Cardinal Manning, Roman Catholic Cardinal Manning, it is by submission to the living authority of the vicar of Jesus Christ, the papacy. The first step of its return must be by obedience to his voice as rebellion against his authority was the first step of its departure, unquote. He proceeds to show that religious toleration is a complete delusion, that the true church can tolerate nothing but absolute and unconditional submission. Quote, neither true peace nor true charity recognize tolerance. The church has the right to require everyone to accept her doctrine, that Quote, the duty of the civil power is to enforce the laws of the Roman Catholic Church, restrain evildoers, and punish heresy. Quoting further, it says, it is astonishing, he writes, how small is the space rightly left to the exclusive dominion of the civil power. Even in passing laws, Parliament must defer to the Roman Catholic Church. The state may enact a law, but it must be it must see that it in no way contravenes the higher laws of the Roman Catholic Church. Dr. Cardinal Tom. Manning plainly asserts that Rome has entered on a struggle between the supremacy of the Pope and that of the crown, that it is a struggle for the life for life and death, and that embraces the whole question of the Reformation in these countries. As Calhoun remarks, quote, it is the old battle fought under the Plantagenists, whether the law of England is to be sovereign and supreme or whether we are to have confederacy of Roman priests aided by treacherous English priests, braving English laws, defying the British Parliament and, t and trampling in the sovereign's crown. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. To the prison of hell he will send just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior we're total loss.